Okay, so welcome again to those who have uh, joined us just in the last uh, minute or so. Uh, again, a very warm welcome to everyone to the very first Tiger in STEM uh, webinar event in the chemistry series of 2021. It is my very great pleasure to introduce you to our chair for today, which is Professor Andrew Goodwin. Um, Andrew was born and raised in Sydney, Australia. He studied at the University of Sydney and uh, Cambridge before moving in 2009 to Oxford, where he's now a professor of materials chemistry. So Andrew, thank you very much for joining us and the floor is yours. Great, well, thanks very much, Caroline, and welcome everyone to this uh, very exciting chemistry webinar this afternoon. What a great thing uh, to, to have go on. I'm absolutely thrilled to be here. Thank you very much for involving me. We've got three great talks coming up. I can't wait to see them. Um, but before we start on those, we've got just a few little bits of uh, housekeeping that I've been asked to share with you. Uh, and I'll just take a moment or two to go through those now. Um, the first thing is, obviously this is a, a very friendly event and there's a code of conduct um, for the event. Uh, I understand that code of conduct is available on the Tigers website through the events pages. And I think someone should be putting a link in the chat right about now that we can, uh, we can click on if need be. Um, I encourage you to take a quick look at it. And of course, um, by being here, I guess we're all agreeing to abide by that code of conduct. And that's of course, just to make sure that we all have a, a, an enjoyable afternoon. Um, there's, I understand, I'm not very good at Zoom, I'm sorry, but um, uh, there are two ways of communicating uh, either with me or with the speakers or the organizers uh, during the webinar. Uh, the first is using the chat box. And I think at the moment, basically everyone will be able to see the chat. Um, as you'd expect, it's, uh, it, we want to be respectful in there and uh, keep the chat on topic, so that makes sense. But there's also a Q&A box, which is going to be your way of um, raising any questions for the speakers. And I'm, I'm going to do my best to keep an eye on that. Uh, and then when we get to the end of the talk, uh, we can go through those questions. But there's no need to wait till the end of the talk um, to put anything in that box. Um, there's also um, some live captioning happening today uh, during the talks. Uh, and if you would like to turn the captions on, if that would be helpful, there is, I think, a button down the bottom. I'm just trying to see it myself. There's a live transcript button on my screen, hopefully the same on yours. Um, and uh, that should give you the captions. Uh, and we're all very grateful to the Transcriber 121 captions for captioning uh, all of the talks here today. Just so you know, uh, this uh, whole webinar is being recorded and should be available in the next day or two on the Tigers YouTube channel. Um, and finally, as you will have noticed, this was a, uh, a free event. None of us had to pay to be here, which of course was great. Um, so if you're in a position to do so, um, the organizers would invite you uh, to make a donation to the Kauri Scholarship Foundation, which wants to fund 100 disadvantaged black British students through UK universities in the next decade. That sounds fantastic. And if you do do that, um, they'd love you to quote tigers in the comment section of your donation. So uh, I think those are the main bits and pieces uh, to go through before the talks. Uh, so I will move on now uh, to introduce our first speaker today, uh, uh, who is Caitlin Sargent. And Caitlin uh, is with us today from the University of Cambridge. She's a fourth year chemical engineering student. Uh, and her talk today is going to be on exploring solid liquid interactions in heterogeneous catalysts using NMR re relaxation measurements. And we look forward to your talk, Caitlin, very much. And don't forget to put those questions in the Q&A box for after Caitlin's speech. Thanks, Caitlin. Brilliant, okay, I'm unmuted now. Hi everyone, I'm gonna be talking to you about the research I carried out for my master's project. I'm aiming to do a quick bit of background and put some things into context before moving on to my aims, um, experimental and analytical methods, and then results and conclusions. So heterogeneous catalysis is an integral part of um, chemical production and the chemical engineering industries. However, 
the understanding of this process is currently very limited, which is largely due to a lack of insight into the solid liquid interactions occurring at the catalyst surface. So many of the models used to describe and explain the adsorption and desorption processes, as illustrated in the bottom figure, are hard sphere models, which assume that the molecules you're dealing with are rigid, and therefore they're not likely to be um, very good at predicting the behavior of flexible molecules. So that's why this research was into sort of when we can use certain models for flexible molecules and when they can just be used for rigid ones. You're probably wondering what enamark relaxation is and maybe how it's characterized. Um, so the relaxation involves um, all of the processes that return the magnetization of a sample to the equilibrium position after perturbation. The equilibrium position as explained in this diagram is the positive Z direction, which is the direction of an external applied magnetic field. Now, two ways to characterize this relaxation. The first is the longitudinal relaxation time, which is called T1. And this characterizes the return of magnetization in the direction of the applied magnetic field. That's denoted by these um, dashed arrows. The second way to characterize it is the transverse relaxation time, T2, which characterizes the decay of magnetization in perpendicular planes, which here is the XY plane. So the primary aim was to investigate relaxation time correlations with interaction strength, as the ratio of T1 over T2 and T1 for bulk samples over that in porous samples um, have been used in the literature as a proxy for interaction strength However, recently it's come to light that these may not be reliable um, in certain classes of flexible molecules. So the way that rigid molecules were classified were molecules with um, significant sp2 hybridization or um, small alkane, cyclic alkanes or um, small aromatic molecules were classed as rigid so it's thought they have approximately constant distances between hydrogen atoms within the molecule, and they have fairly limited internal motions. So the other molecules were classed as flexible, and the pellets we used were mesoporous gamma alumina, which are commonly used as a catalyst support in industry. So the sample preparation was fairly straightforward. Um, for the bulk samples, it simply involved pipetting the liquid into an NMR tube, and for the imbibed samples, it involved drying the pellets overnight in an oven, before soaking them for at least three hours in the desired liquid before the experiment could occur. So the magnet had to be calibrated by a process known as shimming. And a few parameters were set before one dimensional T1 and T2 experiments and a two dimensional T1, T2 experiment were carried out before the data were exported to MATLAB for analysis and processing. So the data were modeled as one dimensional um, exponential functions, as shown in the left hand and center figures for T1 and T2 respectively. And the two dimensional data were displayed as a contour type plot with the ratio of T1 over T2 taken to be the highest point on the contour plot, so the point with the highest probability. So what did we find? Well, for rigid molecules, a positive correlation was observed between the T1 over T2 ratio and relative polarity. However, when water was excluded from the data, the um, goodness of fit was vastly increased. And for the rigid molecules, for the N alcohols investigated, a positive correlation was seen between T1 over T2 ratio with carbon number. However, for the esters and the N alkanes investigated, these correlations weren't particularly significant at all. And for T1 bulk over T1 poor, for rigid molecules, it was found that this was a much stronger positive correlation than for T1 over T2, and also had a much better goodness of fit. However, for the flexible molecules investigated, for esters and the N alcohols, the T1 bulk over T1 poor ratio was found to decrease with increasing carbon number, which is in direct conflict with other results reported in the literature. And for N-alkanes, um, that didn't show a particularly strong correlation at all. So what do we conclude from this? Well, a T1 over T2 ratio 
may not be a reliable measure of interaction strength for all classes of molecule. And the T1 bulk over T1 pore um, appears to be a better measure of interaction strength than T1 over T2 for the imbibed rigid molecules investigated. However, it's found to be a very poor predictor of interaction strength for the flexible molecules investigated. In future, we hope that other people will explore a wider range of rigid molecules and a range of other catalyst support materials, as well as investigating the use of more detailed procedures, such as fast field cycling NMR, in order to um, elucidate information about the systems where these ratios can't be used. So I'd just like to give a few thank yous before I finish. Um, all the experiments were carried out alongside my research partner, Eliza, um, with supervision from my supervisors, Andy and Mick, uh, mentoring from Jordan, and help with running remote experiments from Gemma. So thank you all for listening. Great, thank you very much, Caitlin. That was bang on time and very interesting. Thank you very much. Um, I'm, if it's okay, I'm going to uh, kick off with a question. There's already some pouring in, but be before I get to those, just because I'm going to abuse my position here, can I just ask you about this choice of, um, you said you use polarity and uh, carbon number, two very sensible things. Are they the standard sorts of uh, parameters that people would be looking at here to try and, uh, and look for some influence on rigidity? Um, yes, yeah, so it really depends on the systems you're working with. So we, because we were using gamma alumina, um, which is kind of charged, that's why we used um, relative polarity, because we thought that this would be quite a good proxy for interaction strength for the rigid molecules. And for the flexible ones, um, so for things like N-alkanes, normally you get sort of increases in the number of van der Waals attractions when you increase the carbon number. So that's why we thought, you know, that would be kind of a good measure for that. That's great, thank you very much. So we've got a, a question here from uh, Rachel Oliver, who's asking if none of the ratios work particularly well for flexible molecule interactions, is there an alternative approach for those molecules? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, you can run experiments where you, we were just focusing on having um, the pellets in one liquid, but you can imbibe the pellet in one liquid and then fill up the NMR tube with a different liquid and pop the pellets in and see whether it's um, the first liquid stays within the pellets or whether it gets pushed out by the other one, which can indicate that the second liquid has a stronger interaction um, with the surface. You can do things like that. Great, and I think we've got one last question just before we move on. Um, and that's uh, from an anonymous attendee uh, who's asking about the kind of industry settings that you might see your research being applicable to? Okay, um, so I think basically the basis for our research was um, a thesis from a few years ago, which was on sort of gamma alumina with these flexible molecules. And I think it would mainly be applicable to um, industries where they're using lots of different hydrocarbons um, and things like that. So any of the oil and gas industries really anything where you um, want to maybe dehydrate a molecule. Um, so a lot of different chemical industries, but many ones that you're using a lot of organic molecules to begin with. Great, well, um, if it's okay, I think I'm going to, uh, to draw a line under it there, but thank you, Caitlin, for a really nice talk and what a great way to, uh, to start everything today. I can see there's some other questions and I, I'm sorry, I might um, just move on, but perhaps there's a way of, I might let the uh, more experienced organizers find a way, a way of allowing you to answer that on route. Um, but let's let's move on to our next speaker, who's Shivani Joshi. And Shivani is joining us um, from Sheffield Hallam uh, University. And uh, she's going to talk to us today about assessing the effect of formula variations on the performance of thin film sole gel coatings. Thanks very much, Shivani. Share screen. Hi. Uh, yeah, so uh, I'm Shivani and my project this year was assessing the effect of formula variations on the performance of thin film soil gel coatings. So a bit of background into my project. So infections and biofilm formation are a leading cause in morbidity and mortality. 
Um, and biofilm formations are especially frequent on medical devices such as catheters, orthopedic implants, and implantable electronic devices. And this is a really big issue because you know, biofilms can cause repeated infections and also it's costly to you know, replace implants that can cost a lot of money economically. Uh, and so with a hybrid inorganic organic silk or solid gel uh, coating, you, know, you can control the hydrophobicity, pore size, release of antimicrobials and the adherence onto various materials can be controlled. Um, and so my study you know, focused on analyzing the effects of formula variations on coating performance, which can then allow for a greater understanding of coating properties and enable a tailored antimicrobial release uh, so the start of my project, what I was doing was formulating, you know, these different solid gel coatings. Uh, so table one just shows, you know, the different ones that I had made. So um, it go went from a really high concentration of using acid to, you know, uh, changing the amount of water. So the ones that I'm going to talk about today is solid gel one, which was the standard solid gel, and then solid gel five, which used the least amount of water. So the most important process in solid gel formulation is hydrolysis and condensation. These are the reactions that take place, which you know, then uh, form these silica oxygen silica bonds, uh, which is here. Um, and you know, the rate at which these form then can, you know, these then the end uh, coating is, you know, what you get out of it. So. I used infrared spectroscopy to uh, monitor the rate of these bonds forming over time, so over 168 hours, um, and that's just what I've shown here. So the main uh, peaks to see were the TOS peaks. Uh, this was the silica precursors, and then in the end, it's the silicon oxygen silica bonds that we wanted to look at and see how these formed. So in Figure One, uh, Figure Two, you can see that um, with solid gel one the rate of hydrolysis and condensation was you know extremely steady and you got like a steady you know hydrolysis and condensation rate uh, whereas in solid gel 5 which is the figure on the uh, right hand side at one hour you do get a broader peak of you know these OH uh, which comes from you know the alcohol or from hydrolysis and then what you see is that over time a lot of these peaks decrease and what we're seeing here is that the hydrolysis and condensation rates um, are not equal. And in the end, you're not getting this backbone of silica oxygen silica and they're breaking, so they're not gelling together properly. And you're not, base you're not getting a smooth coating. So the next thing that I did was look at the adherence of these coatings onto uh, different substrates. So what we have is metal, glass, and silicon. And um, over time, we can see that they do somewhat get better, but not hundred uh, percent. I also did some statistics, so some one-way ANOVAs, um, and from these results, you know, we saw that uh, depending on you know the time and formulation, they do cause a difference in how well they adhere to different substrates. The next thing I did was some hydrophobicity analysis. So what I did was um, took some photos of my solid gel coating. So uh, from you know I've got solid gel one, solid gel five, as you can see. Uh, just some photos and I analyzed this using ImageJ just to see if you know there's a difference in you know the hydrophobicity and the density so you can see how solid gel one as I mentioned has a you know a constant hydrolysis and condensation rate so it's a lot smoother whereas solid gel five because um, you weren't getting those the backbone the silicon oxygen silica wasn't bonding as well you get a lot of cracks and the flakes so moving on the next thing I did was a bit of microbiology so um, I wanted to see how, you know, difference, the difference of the coatings, how that affected biofilm formation. So this was the, the method that I used. It was a very simple process of just growing biofilms onto the peg lids, which I had coated previously with my coatings, um, and then stained, and then de-stained, and then quantified this. And this were the results from it. So we can see that solid gel one, very low uh, absorbance. Uh, very low like biofilm formation and solid gel five, which had the most cracks, has the biggest um, formation of the biofilm. And so, what that can relate to is that a rougher surface, you know, you're getting more of a um, ad adhesion of the bacteria. And then the last thing that I did was a bit of bacterial penetration assay. So what we just wanted to see really quickly was whether the coatings themselves would stop bacteria from penetrating through uh, onto the 
you know, the medical device or anything that you wanted to cope uh, with the thin films. Uh, so what I did was had the little inserts, um, which I've drawn up here, uh, we coated the, the bottom of those with the coatings, let it dry, and then filled it with bacteria to see if it would go through. And I also had an indicator put in there just to see, you know, if it did go through. And what we saw was that um, it didn't work to, uh, you know, uh, the soil gel didn't actually stop the bacteria from penetrating through. Uh, yeah, so those are all the results. So yeah, in conclusion, you know, the hydrolysis and condensation rates, um, you know, they were the main processes which then led to, uh, you know, depending on the bioform adhesion. Um, and so by knowing the varied formulations uh, that they can affect their properties, we can then tailor the coating for specific uses. So thank you for listening. Um, Great, thank you very much uh, for that talk, Shivani. And again, thank you for being bang on time. That's really helpful. Um, well, we've got some questions uh, coming in. Uh, let me ask you first one first. Um, what indicator did you use in your multi well plate studies on bacteria penetration on the third from last slide? So, where you showed that? Yeah. What so, was the end one was TTC. Uh, I can't remember the full name. It's like 235 triphenyl something. It's really long. Uh, yeah, that's what we use because it just shows the, you know, it turns red when there's bacteria in it. So it turned red like straight away after 24 hours. Sounds great. Thank you very much. So there's another question here um, saying, first of all, great talk. Um, and then why asking you, why do you think your soul gels were unsuccessful in preventing the bacteria penetration? Yeah, so um, this can be multiple things. So I think we, what I used was 10 microliters of the soil gel coated onto the bottom of the insert. So that might not have been enough to actually prevent it. Uh, other factors can be things like cracking of the soil gel. Like I showed in one of the figures, um, soil gel five especially cracked a lot. So that might have been another factor. Um, yeah, I think those were the main ones as to why it might not have worked. Can I ask you a very quick question, Shivani, about the bacteria themselves? So I think you took, was it, was it E. coli? I was being very, it was Yeah, it was UPEC, Europathic. Yeah, yeah. and yeah. of course, you know, that's a, that's a really canonical one. Would you expect that your results to carry across to other bacteria? Um, in terms of the biofilms, I'm not sure, because I know different uh, bacteria adhere differently onto surfaces. So I think it would just be a thing of, researching it and testing it out <laughs> and just <laughs> knowing how well it grows that's great thanks well there, there's lots of questions let's see how we, you're doing a great job of answering these very quickly so let's go here's another one uh, saying again excellent talk uh, did you consider exploring conducting studies with proteus mirabilis which generated crystalline biofilms and is often associated with catheter blockage uh, no, I, we didn't consider that. Uh, okay. The main one we were using was uh, UPEC because it's frequent in um, like catheter associated UTIs. So that's why we use that one, but we didn't consider uh, the other ones. I see, that's great. And uh, two last questions. Um, I'm going to do these in reverse order. Francesca is asking whether there are any particular safety precautions that you have to take when working with bacteria and biofilms to stop yourself getting infected, I presume. Um, for us, it was just a general, uh, like lab safety, like, you know, keep your lab coat on, keep your goggles on, don't touch your eyes when you're using the bacteria, <laughs> things like that. Yeah, that sounds great. And then our last question, we've gone is quick fire. The last question is, what would you like to do next? What do you want to do after this? Um, I don't know, in terms of the project or in terms of like... <laughs> I mean, yeah, I you would, can answer it however you like, I think, yeah. Um, I mean, it is my last year, but if it if I could carry on this project, there'd be a million things I'd love to do. I'd love to like redo it all with different bacteria and different acid catalysts and see, you know, multiple different variations and what all that causes onto like biofilm adhesion, things like that. But yeah, that's in a very like science-y study <laughs> in a <different> way. <laughs> Well, that's great. Thank you. I'm sure everyone would join me in thanking you, Shivani, for a very interesting talk. Thank you so much. So um, I think we're pretty much on time. It's time then to move on to um, our, our third and final speaker today. Um, I guess 
I, I guess our sort of plenary, and that Zoe is, and I'm delighted that she's, um, she's speaking today. I have only just now met her for the first time, but I have been following Zoe on Twitter, as I'm sure many of you have, and have seen there firsthand, you know, the effect that she's having uh, on, on the community as a whole. And it's a real delight to be here to introduce her today. Um, Zoe is an analytical chemist by background. And uh, after spending several years in academia, um, she moved to industry after her PhD and is now a senior scientist in the water industry. She's also, as many of you will know, a mental health advocate, um, working towards improving mental health uh, in academia. And her talk today is going to cover her career so far, going from a forensic science undergraduate to a senior scientist, as we said, for this international water company. Um, and her talk is not going to focus so much on academic success, um, but the factors that have, interest, uh, that have influenced her en route, uh, influenced the route she's taken, and the story uh, behind what motivates her diversity and inclusion work. So it's a real pleasure uh, to welcome Zoe uh, for her talk today. Thanks, Zoe. Thank you so much, Andrew. Uh, I just wanted to say just a big thank you to the organisers, really, for inviting me to be here today. It was really the physics series, uh, webinar series, where I saw just the amazing work that tigers do in terms of diversity and inclusion. And so I'm super excited to see chemistry get the spotlight too. And also just get to see some amazing talks from, from the other speakers here today. And I'm excited for the whole series. So I'm really looking forward to it. So as Andrew said, I'm gonna to talk today a little bit about my career so far, but I'm also going to talk a little bit about how I felt during my career and what's driven the decisions that I've made behind the career steps that I've taken. So for the first half of my talk, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the science that I've done because I found it super cool and then talk a little bit more about my personal journey. So to give you the glossy CV overview of what I've done so far. So I started doing a forensic science undergraduate back in 2009, which feels like a lifetime ago to me. I really started doing forensic science because I thought that CSI on TV was really cool. Uh, I quickly found out that British crime scene investigation is absolutely nothing like CSI Miami, and we definitely don't have the weather to wear sunglasses. So I was a little bit disappointed with my choice with forensic science, but one of the things that I found that I really, really found fascinating was analytical science. And I found analytical science really interesting because what we can do is really learn about the world around us. And using analytical science for forensics really interests me too. Like for example, if you find that someone has been drink driving, how do you prove that that person is above or below that drink drive limit? And that is where analytical science steps in. And it's so important for us to have confidence in, in our measurements as well, because we wouldn't want to convict someone if they were under the limit, but we also wouldn't want to exonerate someone if they were over. So, you know, just thinking about how analytical science plays into that. So I went on to do an analytical science master's at the University of Warwick before, before then going on to do a PhD in electrochemical sensor development. And I did a little bit of work on boron dope diamond sensors. So I'm gonna talk about that in a minute. I then did a postdoc for a year before going on to be a research scientist in the water industry. So I worked for a hack company. Uh, and more recently, just back in, back in December, I was promoted to senior scientist within my company. And I now lead a small team of researchers and we're actually looking to, to find new technology and develop new chemistries for, for the problems of tomorrow that we're going to face in the water industry. So the first real analytical science project I ever did was doing heavy metal analysis of Iron Age bones. So I've gone a long way from this to the water industry. And I really enjoyed this project. So we used a technique called opti opti uh, sorry, inductively coupled plasma optical emission spectroscopy or ICP OES. And what we were looking at is strontium and calcium ratios within human bones. And these human bones have been found at, iron, at, at Fincop Iron Age Hill Fort which was built around 400 BC. And these human remains were found and we know very little about why these people were there or why they, they were all killed there. So the idea behind this project was to look at these strontium and calcium ratios. And so humans actually absorb strontium throughout, throughout our lifetime and strontium can bioaccumulate in our bones and actually substitute for calcium within the appetite lattice within our bones and in our teeth. And actually strontium is found largely in vegetables and grains. So we can actually infer dietary information from, from these ratios of strontium and calcium. And that allows us to give us some idea as to where someone may, may have come from, 
could they have been from a different tribe or from a, from the same tribe or at least that was the aim of my project and i can categorically tell you that as an undergraduate project we absolutely found no evidence of anything either way but i really enjoyed working on the project and i learned a lot of skills along the way my next project was very, very different. So I actually switched to working on a collaborative project with AstraZeneca, and I took some of this project through to my PhD as well. And um, what we did is we developed a new analytical technique called electrochemical X-ray fluorescence. And this was all done uh, with, uh, with my supervisor, Professor Julie McPherson. And so what we did is we took an electrode, and we, what we would do is place that electrode into a pharmaceutical uh, compound, a liquid, comp a liquid solution. And what we could do is apply a voltage to that electrode. And by doing that, what we can do is actually plate that, that metal or any metals that we have in that pharmaceutical uh, solution out onto our electrode surface. So what we can do is actually use this technique to, to find catalysts or catalyst contamination within pharmaceutical products and detect them. Now, the kind of innovation around this technique was really that our electrode material is made of boron dope diamond. So we use boron dope diamond for two reasons. One is that diamond in and of itself is not conduct electrically conductive. So we can't use that as an electrode material. So when we grow diamond, we actually have to put boron into the growth to actually create our, our electrode that is conductive. And the other thing is that both boron and carbon are actually X-ray invisible to X-rays. So when we take our electrode material and we plate this metal onto our surface, what we can then do is take that piece of diamond out of our electrode and put it into our X-ray fluorescence machine. And then all we're going to pick up is those heavy metals that we've deposited on our surface. So that's kind of the, the really one of the big topics that I covered during my PhD. And one of the really neat things about this technique as well is not only are you detecting what your catalyst contamination is, but you're also removing it at the same time. So from there, I have now transitioned into working in the water industry, and we often take it for granted just how many processes go into getting our clean tap water that we drink every day out of our taps. And so on the left hand side here is a little bit of a, an outline as to some of the processes that go on behind the scenes to get our clean drinking water, and most of these are chemical steps. And so in the water industry, you know, some of these, some of these, uh, some of these techniques on the side here, so measuring pH, luminescent dissolved oxygen, conductivity, turbidity, and oxi oxidative reduction potential are all sorts of measurements that we're taking behind the scenes to make sure that our water is safe. Now, for my job, what I look to do is actually work to solve the challenges of tomorrow. So we know that we measure things like pH and chlorine concentration today. But what are we going to be measuring tomorrow? So my job is to think about uh, technologies ahead of time and actually come up with solutions ahead of time. Now, we don't always get this right, but sometimes we do. So my job involves going to conferences, reading academic literature, and really just coming up with some really cool, neat science with my team. Now, one of the cool bits of science that Hack Company have recently come out with is, is around the fact that during the COVID-19 outbreak, we found that monitoring infections of COVID-19 can be done through wastewater and Hack, in, in collaboration with Lumen Ultra, another company have actually found a way to provide the first world's first rapid on-site COVID-19 water testing solution. So that's kind of some of the work that Hack Company do. So now I've kind of covered a little bit of the science that I've done. What I wanted to do was talk a little bit more about my confidence and talk about my self-worth and how I felt about myself throughout my career. And my confidence has been up and down. And to really talk about some of the major events in my, in my career, really, what I thought was I'd break this down into a few chapters just to kind of explain the background to, to, to me, really, and what makes me the chemist that I am today. So the first thing for me was before going to university and I, I didn't get the A-levels that I was expected to get. I was actually expected to get straight A's. And as you can see, I absolutely did not get straight A's. I did not get into my university of choice. I did not get into my second university. I, I actually ended up getting into university on the merit of my personal statement, which I don't know if I've ever heard anyone else do. Um, and so I was really, really lucky to get onto my course. And that really made me feel 
when when my friends were celebrating I felt like I really had something to prove and that made me work really really hard at university and to a certain extent all my worth then got put on on my academic success so I worked really hard but I also then didn't enjoy a lot of my university life because actually I was really trying to just prove how 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 much I deserve to be there so the imposter syndrome really creeping in a little bit early on the next thing for me was was when I went to choose and do my master's program so I actually really liked toxicology as well as analytical science but I couldn't afford to go and do toxicology so I found a funded analytical science program and that enabled me to go on into higher education and so I think this also for me just highlights the importance of a Cowrie scholarship fund today or foundation today because you know, funding people to make sure that they have opportunity to to pursue higher education is so important and this really was a pivotal point for me because I think I would never be giving this talk right now if I didn't have that choice I didn't well, I really didn't have a choice right and I ended up being the analytical scientist that I am today the next thing for me was when I started my PhD I really started feeling my confidence drop off and my science wasn't going to plan I really I really took that quite personally and that really hit my, my self-worth and my confidence I was really comparing myself with others around me and really thinking well you know I don't deserve to be here and they're doing such a better job than I am and that also really forced me into working long hours because I didn't really know what I was doing which is entirely normal at the start of a PhD program but what I thought was that I needed to catch up and um, what that really led to was me just not looking after myself as I should have done and that really led it to me to the point of reaching a, a depressive phase in my life. So I ended up getting diagnosed with clinical depression. And this figure really demonstrates how I felt at that time. I felt like I was one person among a sea of many, many people doing brilliant jobs and that I was the only person struggling with my mental health. Actually, this image looks something more like this. So about one in two PhD students experience uh, common mood disorders such as anxiety and depression during their PhD. And so when I started to realize that perhaps I wasn't alone, I started to build my confidence back up. I sought help um, and, I, and I actually managed to start working towards finishing my PhD. After postdocing for a year, I decided to leave academia and I got a lot of comments saying you'll be doing repetitive work in industry. You'll be in a cutthroat environment and you won't have the freedom to do your own projects. And that really made me question as to whether or not I wanted to make the leap to industry. And fortunately for me, I did make the leap to industry and I found none of these things to be true in my scenario. So, you know, taking that leap of faith is really important for me. And you know, there were some things that, that really did motivate me to leave academia, like the precarity of postdoc contracts, not being able to see visible role models, uh, just needing the time off and not feeling like I had to work constantly. And then some of the things like wanting to be able to afford to, to buy a house. So all of these things really factored into me moving over to industry. And then finally, in more recent times, um, I, I was promoted to senior scientist and I was considering whether to go to senior scientist. And I had this comment from someone that I, that I really respect. And they said, I think you're a bit too young to be a senior scientist. And just for a moment, that made me think I should not apply and, and apply to, for my promotion. But thankfully, I, I thought a little bit harder about this and I thought, well, if I'm going to go for my promotion, I'll, I'll bring some proof. So what I did was I actually signed up to the Royal Society of Chemistry Chartered Chemists Programme, which is really uh, designed around proving that you are working at a senior scientist level. And I took that to my, to my interview for promotion and said, look, the Royal Society of Chemistry think I'm capable. So you should too. And that worked really well for me. I also really learned at that time point just the importance of having someone sponsoring you as well and that there's a lot of support within my within my work environment of people saying yes you should promote this person and she and she she will do a good job so you know really the support of people around me has been really essential to that as well the other thing that has really helped my confidence which i don't often think gets mentioned as much as perhaps it should do is doing in inverted commas extracurricular work so throughout my PhD and master's, um, really what I've done is I've done a lot of extracurricular work and this has really helped me boost my confidence. So I've written outreach articles, 
I did a, a long, long time working on a committee for the Analytical Science Network, which allowed me to run a national conference. And now more recently, I work on international water standards for the, for the British Standards Institute. And these are all steps that I've taken, um, mostly voluntary, or you know, I've simply asked. And as part of my career, I've actually helped me find out what I enjoy. So I, if, if there's any advice I can give today is to simply ask someone if you can help out somewhere. And the worst thing that they're going to say is say no. And this kind of just leads me a little bit onto also my mental health advocacy work because my experience during my PhD made me realize just how not alone I was and that mental health within academia is super important and something that we absolutely need to be talking about. And I couldn't let that go. So even though I work in the water industry, I do do my mental health advocacy on the side. So I just wanna highlight a couple of things that I do. So the first thing for my mental health advocacy work is creating resources. So I've created a range of posters to really highlight some of the pressures and some of the mental health concerns that people face within academia. I, I really have created these resources as a starting point for conversation. Yeah, I don't know everything. I'm obviously a scientist. I'm not trained in mental health. I do have lived experience so that's what I've tried to put into these posters and you can find them all on my website just down on the bottom here and they're all free to download and distribute. The other thing that I've worked on which you know I'm super I couldn't have done this without the people that have been involved is actually worked on what I, what I called the 100 voices project and this invo involved 100 researchers coming forward and talking about their mental health openly and just showing that being a researcher in, in STEM and having mental illness doesn't doesn't is, is not something that you like you can't you can't define someone by their mental illness there are so many successful and, and wonderful scientists within within stem that that have mental illness and that's okay and so this this kind of campaign has really worked to try and normalize the conversation around mental health and then finally just to mention more recently, I started a blog called Voices of Academia with Dr. Marissa Edwards, who is in Australia. So, you know, one of the great things about the pandemic has been a bit of international collaboration. And now there's a whole team of us working on the blog. And we also have a podcast, again, just normalising the conversation around mental health in academia and talking about people's different experiences. Because, again, with, with the kind of statement of one in two PhD students experiencing mental health concerns within academia, there is a lot of nuance lost in that, in that statement. We don't know what those experiences are. So we really wanted to focus on lived experiences and highlight them and talk about them. So that's what Voices of Academia does. And then finally, just to conclude about how I feel about myself and my worth over, over my career. So when I started my scientific career, I really kind of based my own self-worth on, on four things, really. Science going to plan, which, by the way, it rarely does. Getting publications, uh, getting awards and being recognised for the work that I do and also being a scientist. And what I realised as, as I progressed through my career is just how little some of these things matter. There's everything else that makes me me. That includes my mental illness. It includes all the other things that I enjoy doing. And being a scientist is a huge portion of me and being a chemist is a huge portion of my identity, but it's not all of my identity. And so, yes, I am more than a chemist and I've had a heck of a lot of fun along the way so far. And with that, I just wanted to say thank you ever so much for the, to the people that have got me this far and I hope they know who they are. And with that, thank you very much for listening. Well, thank you, Zoe. That was an absolutely amazing, inspirational talk. That was really wonderful. And I know a lot of it resonated with me, and I'm sure it will have resonated with everyone here listening uh, today. Um, I think I'm in a bit of shell shock, to be honest, and uh, I'm sure a few others were. We're going to have some questions coming, I know. But can I just ask you, uh, just to kick things off, I, you know, I was exposed to you on Twitter, and I was wondering whether you could say something about whether you're finding social media to be good or bad in all of this? Is it, uh, is that a fair question to start with? Yeah, yeah. Um, so there are some dark places of social media. Um, I cannot deny that. But for the most part, I have found a community of people that are very kind, that, uh, you know, I, I've made friends through social media. I think I've made connections through social media. 
I think it's a really great place, particularly when when we talk about diversity and inclusion issues, often we can feel quite isolated. And I think that social media provides a platform for us to connect all over the world and also drive for change. So I think it's been a really important part of my journey, really. Yeah, well, thanks for that. Um, Rachel's asking a question uh, here now about um, sort of a hypothetical question. If you could um, pick any scientific area that you've worked on in an earlier part of your career for you to return to, uh, what, what would it be having been through these different, different bits and pieces? I think I would be working in some kind of archaeology or, you know, I'd, I, because I because I really like x-ray fluorescence work, I, I've seen a lot of people looking at paintings and stuff with x-ray fluorescence and I find that stuff absolutely fascinating, like finding invisible um, bits of art. Um, I think that would be the sort of area that I probably, if I could go back and do, would be, you know, art and forensics is something that I find really fascinating. Great, thanks Zoe. We've got a, a few questions coming in. There's one here from Bavik, who's asking um, your, your opinion of how you feel we can best tackle the issue of mental health in academia, uh, given the amount of stigma, uh, yeah, stigma there is around the topic. So I think what we have to do to start with is just have these conversations. And, and I've been very lucky with the 100 Voices project that I've done that there has been a lot of people coming forward to have these conversations. And when I started doing the project, I, I kind of thought about calling it 10 voices because I was like, oh, surely 100 people won't come forward. But what I found was actually 100 people did come forward and then another 100 and then another 100. So like, I think a lot of the time there are people there that are willing to have these conversations. And if those people are willing to take, take the step, then hopefully that enables other people to then come forward and we make the space safer as we go. Great. Thank you. Um, a question from Neil. First of all, he's saying thank you for the talk, Zoe. Um, and then he was saying he wondered, what do you think are the key ingredients for good mentoring in science? I think the, the big thing that just sprung to mind then was transparency for me. And, and, and actually, again, I think that as a, as a mentor, we can often put on a front and we can take a very professional stance as we might want to call it and we don't allow anyone to see any any of the human side of us and I think it's incredibly important that we do enable a little bit of that and let our let our students know that actually it's okay to be feeling like an imposter because we all feel like an imposter and and having those conversations and yeah just being a little bit bit more transparent about who we are as people and I know that that really depends on the person you don't you don't have to tell everyone everything um, but just being a little bit more human, I think, is really important. Thanks, Zoe. Um, Alice is asking uh, whether you feel your options for outreach are more limited in industry. That's an interesting one, isn't it? Um, do you feel that academia had more opportunities and do you miss them, if so, for that sort of wider engagement outside of Twitter? They're making the point here, yeah. So I, I still do a load of, a load of outreach work. Um, so I think it really depends on the company. So my company is really good and we, I'm, I'm allowed to do the things that I enjoy and like, like coming to do this talk today, is something that, you know, I'm allowed to do. And I think that, it, yeah, it really depends on the company and the ethos of the company. And for me, particularly with, with my history of mental health concerns, I was always going to gravitate towards a company that allows me to be me. And part of that work is doing outreach work. And as well, I have links with the Royal Society of Chemistry. I'm on a couple of committees. So that also enables me to do outreach work through those areas as well. And um, having relationships with the Royal Society of Chemistry and being on committees is still things that are encouraged in industry. Um, so you may I ask a question of my own, which uh, just picking up on one of the things that you were saying in your own background. I'm very conscious, for example, in our department that we have lots of speakers, lots of talks, but they're nearly always with academics. There might be, yes, there might be students, postdocs, um, but, it, but it's nearly always within the sphere of academia. And it's very rare that we have people say from industry or civil, so, you know, all sorts of aspects of life come. Do you see, so do you see any sort of mental health implications of that? Do you think that that can play into sort of expectations and so on as well? I was just wondering your view on that. 
yes, I absolutely do. So the academic job market is more competitive than it has ever been. And in, the, in reality, if we're going to do a PhD, the chances of us being a professor one day is very, very low. And so I think it's really important from an institutional level to actually talk about some of the career prospects that we have outside of academia. And also we're really good in academia to consider industry as other, mm. when actually industry for the most part is probably the majority. <laughs> so we should be having these conversations and you know, there was so much fear fear when I was making the transition to industry that I wouldn't be able to be creative and that I would be doing the same thing every day. And I found that just to not be the case. And I have such creative freedom. And I, I basically feel like I'm in academia, but with better pay and better work-life balance. And I, I'm like, why not? So. <laughs> to be fair, there's probably an element of us all uh, trying to validate our own choices, right? You know, by- uh, Of course. <laughs> So that's a, that's a really interesting point. I think it's something that's certainly on our minds to do something about locally, but uh, I was very interested for your, your thoughts there. So, uh, well, I, I think, you know, you've raised lots of really important topics and, uh, you know, thank you again for sharing all of that uh, with us today and all of the things that you're doing um, on, on the side that all of us, are, I think, are, are well aware of. Thank you so much for your time today, Zoe, and for that very inspirational talk. I'm sure everyone will join me in thanking you. Thank you very much for having me. So um, that's going to bring our uh, webinar today, uh, the scientific content to a close. Um, but this is the not this isn't the end of the whole thing. We've got another webinar coming up in, in two weeks' time uh, on June the second. Uh, I think the format is going to be very similar. So there'll be two shorter talks uh, followed by a longer talk. Uh, and the speakers coming are Mohammed Katish, uh, who's going to be talking to us, I can see here, on uh, uh, making a major contribution to renewable energy. And the other is Claire Ji Yijia, who's going to be talking about her encounter with computational chemistry. And then the longer talk is um, by Dr. Jenny Zhang, who's uh, in the chemistry department at Cambridge. And uh, well, I'm biased because she's an Australian and so am I, but she does give an absolutely fantastic talk and I, we're all going to look forward to that. She's going to talk to us about her work on um, natural and artificial photosynthesis and I'm sure uh, we'll all be uh, very excited to see that. So um, I think that's uh, uh, all from me. There's just a reminder here that you can sign up for those talks using Eventbrite. Uh, there'll be a link in the chat, so I understand. Um, and I think also there's a short evaluation form um, and one of the hosts is going to put a link in the chat, I believe, um, that you could click on and give your feedback on how things worked out today. But certainly for my part, I very much enjoyed the talk. I could see there were lots of great people here as well listening in. I had a, a quick little look at the attendee list. And so uh, great to feel part of a really exciting afternoon. And thank you to the organisers for making this happen. I'll hand back over to them. They may, I'm sure I've missed some bits and pieces. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Andrew. I think this is all uh, from our side. And Clara, are you happy to stop the recording? Yeah, I just need to find the button. I'll stop the sharing. Uh, yeah, thanks so much for joining everybody. And don't forget that link uh, for the feedback. That would be really wonderful. Thank you. Thank you all.